Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to all of you uh, to our program, Qingming Here and Forever After. Uh, my name is Sarah Ling. I'm the Exhibition and Program Manager of the Chinese Canadian Museum. And on behalf of our Board of Directors and staff, we would like to welcome you to our second virtual program. Um, for those of us, for those of you who are new to our society, we were formally established back in March of 2020. And we are working to establish a Chinese Canadian Museum, uh, which will be uh, based in Vancouver Chinatown as a provincial hub, but we will have spokes uh, around the province. And so as we continue to um, establish a footprint, we're very excited to be able to connect with all of you um, in your various um, uh, cities and, and communities. So um, do drop a note in the chat box to share where you might be tuning in from. And um, I'd like to acknowledge that we are also joined by uh, our chair of the board, Grace Wong, as well as other members of the board and our staff team. So um, a big welcome from all of us. Um, tonight, we have the pleasure of hearing from three members of our board of directors. Um, and before I introduce them, I'd like to also acknowledge that um, where we are located in Vancouver um, is on the traditional ancestral and unceded lands of the Musqueam Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh people. And for those of you who reside in other places around the province or beyond, uh, we invite you to take a moment to think about uh, the lands that you are on and the communities that um, make uh, your work possible. So for this evening, uh, we will hear from John Adams, Dr. Imogene Lim and Dr. Henry Yu. Uh, they will each share a brief presentation uh, we also have two videos that will be played um, during that portion, and it's great to see um, Charlene Thornton Joe here, who appears in one of the films. Um, and following that, there will be time for a, a Q and A. So, if you do have questions, we invite you to um, type them out in the chat box, and we will monitor um, that during the program. the The formal program will conclude at eight pm to respect uh, your time. Um, but all the speakers have agreed to stay behind if there's interest in having a, a further dialogue. So just a quick introduction for each of our speakers. Um, John Adams has extensive experience working in museums and the cultural sector in BC. Currently, he's the operator of Discover the Past in Victoria, providing walking tours, historical research, and uh, writing. Next, we'll hear from Dr. Imogene Lim. Um, as a descendant of Cumberland and Vancouver's Chinatown, she's an anthropologist by trade. Uh, Dr. Lim's experience on Chinese Canadian communities, especially on Vancouver Island, spans well over two decades. And her work has included um, numerous collaborations with local museums. She currently teaches at the Vancouver Island University. And finally, we'll hear from Dr. Henry Yu. Um, as a history professor, uh, Dr. Yu's research and teaching has been built around collaborations with local community organizations, civic institutions, and multiple levels of government. Um, Dr. Yu teaches at the University of British Columbia and is the head of the Initiative for Student Teaching and Research in Chinese Canadian Studies. So first we will invite uh, John Adams to, to share. Thank you, Sarah, and good evening, everyone. And to continue the territorial acknowledgement, I'd like to mention that here in Victoria, I'm speaking from the traditional territories of the Lekongan speaking peoples. I moved to Victoria in 1960, and the following year, as a 12-year-old, I had a wonderful experience that still stands out in my mind, and that was to get on my bicycle and travel not too far, about 10 minutes away from where I lived, to the Chinese cemetery. My father had told me that there was something special going on that day. It was October 1961. I'd been there before with my friends. It was a, a wonderful place to explore. But what it was, was a mass burial. I understood exactly what they were doing. There were 850 plus boxes of bones that had reposed in the bone house. I didn't understand exactly why they were burying them at that time, uh, or in fact, why they weren't sent back to China, which I was told had been the original plan. Uh, 
But nonetheless, it stands out in my mind as something that um, will forever uh, resonate with me. And I found out later, of course, that the reason for the bone house, the reason for the mass burials was that the bones were intended to go back to China. And this was very much part of the concept of filial piety. Um, uh, it's a part of the Confucian philosophy, um, a social um, hierarchy within uh, society generally, uh, in which everything has a place. And so uh, in the old days, uh, when it was all very sexist, uh, the son would uh, uh, obey the father, the wife would obey the husband, and the younger people would obey the older people. And you can uh, translate that also to the the subjects would obey the emperor, the ruler. Of course, things have changed, certainly during the 20th century. And so um, it's not so male oriented, but in the old days, and the old days included uh, the uh, earliest Chinese arrivals here in British Columbia after 1858. And the idea of filial piety is very, very important. The children um, obey the parents. And it's not just blindly obeying the parents, but making sure that they do what is good for the parents and to help the parents make proper decisions. And this does not end when the parents die. So filial piety continues into the afterlife as well. So a son will, of course, make sure that his parents are comfortable and provided for as they get older. But when they die, he makes sure that their gravesite is properly chosen so that the feng shui is going to allow them to repose in peace for eternity, but also to make sure that the parents and the ancestors in general are going to have the food, the money, the clothing, and all the things that they need, uh, they needed in lifetime that they will have in the afterlife. And it was traditionally the oldest son who was responsible for making sure that the parents were comfortable in life and in death. The senior wife, the first wife, might assist. Uh, concubines and junior wives usually did not. But in fact, the oldest son was to make sure that this was being done. It could be done on a daily basis. And every home would probably have some sort of altar for the ancestors. And perhaps there would be an ancestral hall in the village as well. And this was to make sure that the spirit of the ancestors, the spirits of the ancestors had a place to stay in the home because they were very much part of the life of the living. The soul, when somebody died, would be divided into three parts. This is the theory. And although there are so many different variations, this is generally the traditional belief. Part of the soul would repose at the grave. Part would repose in the ancestral tablet at the home or the ancestral hall. And then the other part, the remaining third, would go into purgatory and would work its way through a series of different trials. And there are horrible depictions of the various chambers of hell. And depending on one's understanding of what this involves, it will involve a trial based on what one had done during his or her lifetime. And the one that stands out in my mind is the chamber of ripping out of the tongues. So if you were a gossip, or if you maligned people, then your tongue would be constantly ripped out uh, when you entered that chamber. And you had to pass these various chambers and making sure that all your sins were atoned for. And you might never come out, but hopefully eventually you did. And in order to, to make sure that the, the soul was going to rest in peace, the son, the male descendants would make sure that the grave was properly chosen so that the forces of feng shui would allow it to rest easily and not in a place where perhaps they were going to be disrupted. But there were two burials. The first burial traditionally was for seven to 10 years. There was no set amount, but long enough for the flesh to rot from the bones. And then the bones would be exhumed and they would be reburied in the permanent place, the ancestral burial site. And that's really where the feng shui really, really counted. And there were four times when the oldest son, who really performed the duty of the family priest, the family home was the temple, 
and the oldest son or the oldest male within the family would be the priest. And it was his job to make sure that at least four times during the year, the grave would be visited, once would be at New Year, once would be at Qingming, which we have uh, just finished this past weekend, once would be sometime in the seventh month, the ghost month, and the other time would be on the double ninth, uh, the ninth of the ninth month, Cheng Yang. Other times would be appropriate, but those are the four times when it would be very appropriate. And Qingming, the one that has just uh, passed, and people might still be observing it, um, was the most important of all, tomb sweeping day, to clean the grave and to provide the food, money, and clothing that the souls of the, the dead might need in the afterlife. As times changed in the 20th century, as uh, society became much more liberal, and certainly the male dominated society um, uh, very much opened up and women uh, became much more part of this, this process. And governments changed, the, the whole concept of um, honoring the dead changed. And at one time, of course, uh, in the Cultural Revolution, it was uh, frowned upon very much. The traditions continue in many parts of China they certainly continue uh, here in Canada and in other places as well. And I think it's time right now to look at the video that Sarah had mentioned. Charlene thornton Joe is a counselor here in the city of Victoria, has been now for almost 20 years. And uh, she knows the Chinese cemetery very well. And I'd like to introduce the video that features her, um, a clip mostly from the Chinese cemetery that dates back to 1903 and a very brief glimpse of Charlene at the Royal Oak Burial Park as well. I think we're ready for the clip now. I'm here at the Chinese cemetery at Harling Point uh, on a beautiful day. And uh, I'm here as I do every year uh, to acknowledge and to recognize Qingming Festival. Uh, Qingming Festival is a time where we uh, come to the cemetery to honor our ancestors, to show respect, and to leave offerings. Uh, so on Qingming, I come to the Chinese cemetery where my grandfather is buried, but I also go to the Royal Oak Cemetery, um, as well as, as many of my other relatives are buried there. Uh, when we come, uh, we will uh, first acknowledge that uh, we miss them and that we that we've come to uh, celebrate their lives and their contributions and for many people uh, that are buried in the Chinese cemetery many of them were some of the first survivals uh, the cemetery actually uh, ceased burials uh, in 1950 so all those that are buried here were buried before that date and so my grandfather is one of the last burials here and Many of these individuals that came here were, as I said, the, some of the first arrivals um, and who came to give uh, folks like me, the second or third generation, an opportunity for a better life. Uh, so in celebration of Qingming, uh, it gives me the opportunity to thank all those who, through their sacrifices, have given me opportunities that I might not have had uh, without their, uh, their endurance, their, as I said, their sacrifice, and, and, and many of the hardships that they had endured. When you see the altars here, uh, that is for uh, burning, whether you're burning people money, lighting incense. Uh, and this is to display uh, many offerings of food, flowers. Uh, if your family member uh, likes a certain type of tea, you might display some, uh, some tea. If your family member liked a, a little bit of uh, scotch or rye, you might put a little glass of that as well. Uh, for example, my mother and father, uh, when I go to the Royal Oak Cemetery, um, I'll be leaving a little bit of rye. Uh, my mother loves Chanel number no. five, so I'll leave a little bottle of that. And I have to admit my mother was a smoker, so I always leave her a little cigarette uh, just so that she uh, ha can have a little bit of joy and something that she enjoyed during Qingming especially. So I'm happy to be here. We have a lovely day. And of course, um, the, this location was chosen because of what we call the feng shui, uh, which means it had a good element that brought uh, peace, brought good luck. And many believe that the water allowed those here 
uh, to see the ships and think about the ships returning home to their homeland. Uh, many of the folks that were buried here uh, never intended to stay in uh, Victoria. They had intended to be buried in their homeland back in China uh, because they came here to raise some money and hopefully send some money back home uh, for a better life in China. But many of the individuals now, for example, my grandfather decided that Canada was now their home. Uh, and as I mentioned, he is uh, one of the last burials uh, at the Chinese cemetery. Coming to the cemetery uh, has special meaning to me. Uh, one, because I was very close to my mother. And uh, my mother used to go to the cemetery quite often uh, to visit family members. Uh, she was very superstitious in that way. And as the youngest uh, of her children, uh, I was often the one that was uh, brought, put in the car and be brought down here. And uh, my mother would uh, go to the grave and start to do, you know, part of chimney was cleaning the grave, sweeping the clean. So it would mean tidying up, whether it was pulling weeds, whether it was like cutting some of the grass. And my mother would say, you know, come back in 10 minutes and I would go and run on the rocks and uh, have a, a great time. And then I would head back to uh, where my mother was at my grandfather's grave. And it would be time for us to uh, put down some flowers uh, and to uh, show our respect. And those were wonderful times as I grew older. Um, my mother uh, then relied on me to drive her to the cemetery and I look forward to that uh, because of the memory. And through the years, the cemetery started, the grass started to get a little bit longer. And uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, it wasn't as maintained uh, to the same degree it is now for a short period of time. So I asked the uh, Chinese Consolidated Benevolence Association if uh, I could weed eat and, and do the grass around my grandfather's grave. And they said, absolutely, if that's what I want to do. So I did that and it looked so great. I asked if I could do the section right by my grandfather's grave. And they said, uh, sure, if that's what you want to do. And that looked so good that I asked if I could just keep going. And for three years, my husband and I mowed and we did uh, the Chinese cemetery as volunteers. Um, and the uh, Chinese Consolidated Benevolent Association uh, did recognize that uh, you know it really helped people that were coming to the cemetery to, to honor their ancestors. Uh, and so they decided to uh, pay caretakers to look after the law. It definitely is a, a wonderful setting uh, for the Chinese ce uh, cemetery. And of course, it was built uh, because of the discrimination of the day, uh, because uh, people didn't want to be buried where Chinese were also buried. And so, um, unfortunately, the cemetery was built for, for uh, sad and, and discriminatory reasons. Um, but, uh, you know, today we know, we recognize that it's a national historic site, and uh, we're proud of that. And, and it's, uh, it's a reflection of the discrimination that existed back then. And, Unfortunately, uh, there is some uh, even today, and uh, and it also reflects the, the endurance of the Chinese community. Um, so my grandfather's uh, grave, his name is Wang Qi, and he was my mother's father. And I always have to bring a container because uh, they don't uh, have containers here. And, Salt sea air erodes all the containers. I think to put one picture, I have it, and I bring my water as well. And I brought some flowers, and often I'd go out and uh, purchase flowers, but uh, my mother always loved it when it was flowers from the garden. And she would also tell my grandfather that these were from the garden. And I remember. Uh, one time I asked my mom, you know, what she talked to my grandfather about. And I remember she once told me that uh, she, she asked uh, her father to make sure she wins the 649. Uh, unfortunately, that never came to fruition, but, you know, I think she asked for lots of things, good health, and, and uh, you know, I think uh, that became true. And she always talked about her father and how he was a very kind and, and sweet man. Uh, unfortunately, he passed away before I was born, um, but uh, I know my mother loved him, both of her parents deeply, and uh, definitely so with my, with my grandfather. So when I used to play, I used to, she would call me over, and 
uh, we would put flowers there and uh, then she would teach me to uh, bend over or kneel down and to show my respect I would either do my hand three times or um, if, if needed uh, that I would just stay standing and bow three times. And that's a, a way to show respect uh, for, for those, as I said, who gave us opportunities that we might not have had uh, if it wasn't for their sacrifices. So I just wanted to say I'm thinking of you and I hope uh, you're enjoying spending time with mom now that she's uh, there with you. Well, a very moving uh, video uh, featuring Charlene Thornton Joe. And uh, I'd like to thank Charlene for having given up uh, a very beautiful day at the Chinese cemetery. Uh, and uh, also our videographer, uh, Derek Ford, a local videographer here in Victoria. And with that, I'd like to now uh, turn over the uh, presentation to Dr. Imogene Lim. And uh, she will tell us a little bit more about uh, some of the uh, cemeteries throughout British Columbia. Good evening, everyone. And I'm uh, zooming in from the traditional territories of the Nanaimo peoples. Uh, so for those who don't know, that is Nanaimo. So I'm going to do, as I say, a share screen. And uh, so what, what you're looking at is the Heritage BC map of uh, Chinese Canadian heritage sites. So I do want to make you aware of this. So this was a outcome of the Leg Legacy Initiatives Advisory Committee, uh, which I was on and as well as uh, Dr. Henry Yu. So this shows you basically the distribution of Chinese sites uh, that community people uh, acknowledged and submitted as meaningful places of in their own communities. Uh, so you can see in the in the lower half of BC, there's a much greater concentration. <coughs> so I am focusing on the cemeteries. So if you so I hope that that uh, either Sarah or Winnie who's Behind the scenes, we'll put the, the link for heritagebc.ca so that uh, you can look at uh, this map on your own. So if you just click on that, uh, the symbol that looks like uh, a gravestone that will allow you to look at memorials. They're not all cemeteries, so they're memorials, they're events. So things that have significance, obviously, and those that have the two stars, those are recognized sites. So again, part of this is to illustrate that Chinese Canadian, the early pioneers were found throughout the province. Because I know today, when people think of the Chinese Canadian population, they gravitate to either talking about Vancouver's Chinatown or Victoria's Chinatown, but they really don't think of communities outside of those two major areas. So part of this is to, to remind people that uh, the pioneers were all over. So my point of uh, sort of pointing out this map is to talk a little bit about Chinese cemeteries. So in this particular slide, uh, on the left side, you see the Kamloops Chinese Cemetery. And the one on the right is the old Hillcrest uh, Chinese Cemetery. So Kamloops, people will probably recognize, oh yes, Kamloops, you know, had a, a sizable Chinese population and there was this, in fact, formal cemetery. But probably not unless you're on the island, even then I would say it's less likely that you are familiar with the old Hillcrest Chinese Cemetery. So the first time I encountered the old Hillcrest Cemetery was in um, 2012. And 
this explains why the, the grass was uh, growing high, you know, like what, what Charlene had talked about, you know, because people go it intermittently to visit the cemetery, the grass does grow unless it is being cared for. And you can certainly see in the Kamloops uh, slide uh, portion that there was, in fact, uh, the grass was growing quite high. So part of mentioning the cemeteries or gravestones is that it marks the presence of those early Chinese that were found throughout British Columbia. Because in the locations that Chinese had been in, the population, if it does exist, it's probably a handful. It, it does not have the same numbers that were in what you might call the heyday. So this is why I've entitled this slide Forever After. It is those gravestones that are the reminder that the Chinese were uh, working throughout British Columbia. So the left portion of the slide is of the old Hillcrest Cemetery. And part of showing you that is one of the things that John had said that after uh, anywhere from seven to 10 years, the body would be dug up. So you can see in certain cemeteries that there's subsidence so that there is this hollowing out on the surface uh, that would indicate uh, that sort of either the collapse of the grave or an indication that a burial had been removed. The image on the right side is for Shimanus. And for those of you who go to Shimanus to visit, you recognize that there was a Chinese community because of the murals. Well, there is in the Shimanus Cemetery this memorial. And uh, the red arrow is pointing to where you would make your offerings. And Back in uh, 2011, I did a road trip just to familiarize myself with the basically the contributions of the early Chinese Canadian community. So I did my, uh, as I say, my travels to cemeteries just to see who was there. And I've marked on this map uh, the locations I went to. So the lower map is, or lower image is of Lytton. So it is a pioneer uh, cemetery. And I've noted uh, one of the gravestones of Lo Bing Chang. And you can see that he was born in 1885, died in 1964. So, so when you look at some of these dates, you recognize that uh, the Chinese community, Chinese Canadian community was present fairly early on. The image from Clinton, uh, the top image, is of an infant death and the infant uh, Stanley Chow. He died in 1924. And then I zipped all the way over to Revelstoke. So part of my road trip was to sort of follow the path of the CPR rail, because obviously there would have been many Chinese involved in the building of the railway. And of course, people stayed behind. So the two gravestones that I have, uh, the individuals died in 1954. So for those of you who, who like to, you know, as I say, do that ground truth thing, getting out there on the landscape and visiting cemeteries to see, well, you know, who, who were here and uh, sometimes it indicates uh, what kind of uh, job they may have had or whether they died by accident because uh, lots of mining occurred. There would be evidence of commentary in terms of mining accidents. So Chinese community, as I said, here, here and here. So I wanted to point out uh, the Ashcroft Chinese Cemetery. Again, this was part of my road trip. Uh, the cemetery is interesting in part because it is between the road and the railway. So as I've indicated, it was established in 1890. Uh, and 
it was actually quite derelict. And in the uh, roughly, I think it was 2012, um, a, a service organization decided that they would uh, imp make improvements to the site. So you have it fenced off, you see the actual um, monument uh, acknowledging the Chinese in helping to build the uh, railway. And then I've got one gravestone and you can see that being in the interior, what the climate has done to the gravestones. So this uh, gravestone that you see in the middle for uh, Chao uh, Sioni, it's quite weathered, but some of those those stones, the whatever was on the surface of, uh, of it was actually all dried out and broken apart from the extreme heat. Uh, there is also a pioneer cemetery in Ashcroft, and there are also Chinese buried there. And then I kind of come back to the old Hillcrest Chinese cemetery. Um, I came to know of this cemetery in 2012, and I didn't know it as the old Hillcrest Chinese Cemetery. I just thought, wow, there's a Chinese cemetery, cemetery here, and it's close to Duncan. So I, I did, you know, as they say, that the search, you know, is there a Duncan Chinese cemetery? And I later found out that it was called the Old Hillcrest, named after the Hillcrest Lumber Company. And it was the owner of the lumber company, Carlton Stone, who donated the property. So I know that there are over 120 burials here. And in the sort of uh, Google overhead, the Google Earth shot of the cemetery, you can see that there's quite a number of burials there. So in coming to know about the Old Chris, old Hillcrest Chinese Cemetery, I realized it was actively used. Um, so one of the things that John had talked about was the Double Ninth Festival. So I had the opportunity back in 2013 to participate in the double night, the Chongyang. And it was, I was only one of three women attending. So, and I probably was, if not the youngest, the, the second youngest. So it's an indication of, and I'm not, I'm not that young. So, so it's an indication that these traditions are certainly in the area that I live in is uh, for a much older, uh, group of individuals, and you can see what the offerings were being provided. So Charlene talked about the cigarettes. Well, there you see cigarettes being offered. They're actually lit to ensure that the essence of the cigarettes are provided to the ancestors. They were in fact player cigarettes. So I think it's for me interesting that they're player cigarettes and the beverage of choice was lucky beer. And if you're from the island, you know that uh, lucky beer is definitely one of those for that generation that do not drink craft beer as, as many younger people do today. Ceremonies are also held when um, there are special events. So, uh, on that uh, Heritage BC map, there is another recognized site, and this is the Cumberland Chinese Cemetery. So back in 2017, we did the official plaque unveiling. So there again was offerings made. Um, you can see food. Uh, in this case, tea was being provided and of course, the burning of money. So this is uh, that reminder that honoring one's ancestors is important. And I want to sort of end my portion of this presentation with my visit to my ancestral home. So my ancestral home is in uh, Toisan, and the village is actually called Lamukde in Gonghoi. 
And uh, this is inside the house. Uh, and you can see the tablets and other uh, places within the house where offerings are made because you can see the little ceramic container with uh, the sand where the incense would be placed. So the home, as uh, John indicated, was a ritual place for honoring ancestors. So with that, I'm going to stop here and I'm going to pass over to my colleague, uh, Dr. Henry Yu. Thanks, Emma Jean. Uh, I just wanted to uh, acknowledge the where I'm coming, uh, speaking from. Um, I'm on Musqueam territory at the University of British Columbia. I live on campus. So I'm really lucky to be here. And, uh, and also, I'm really happy to be here with all of you virtually. Um, and thanks uh, to uh, this uh, Chinese Canadian Museum for organizing this. Thanks to John and Emma Jean for for sharing a, a, a bunch of information, and it was uh, wonderful to see Charlene at uh, Harling Point. I uh, used to live in Victoria, and it's, it's one of the iconic places for for those who haven't been to Harling Point. Or, uh, it's it's a beautiful setting. Um, we're going to play a little short video with uh, that uh, Doris Chow and Jeffrey Wong uh, made. Uh, kind of how do you shop for the stuff you need to do to basically do Qingming? And so um, a short little video, but uh, I think it's a, a nice way to think about where you can go in Chinatown to uh, to get the, the things and, and what are the things you need. Uh, uh, going into detail in ways that uh, Charlene already showed us when she brought things to her grandfather's grave. But uh, go ahead and play that. Uh, thanks. Hi, my name is Doris Chow and I'm here at the Chinese Canadian Museum's inaugural exhibition. Today, we'll be going out into Chinatown to shop for Qingming supplies for the upcoming festival. This is a family business. Look at all the stuff that's in here. Bare minimum, you have to have candles, incense, and yun bowl. So like kind of like paper, uh, money that we burn later on. So for more personalized touch for personal ancestors, we have things like favorite food that you can burn for your ancestors in the afterlife. So we're buying some white sugar rice cake and some pastry it's called seal bang, yin ping traditional pastry. Never cut the chicken before giving it to the ancestors. It's for them to eat, not you. <laughs> so now we're at Helen's floor, where it's actually city garden floor. City garden floor, by Helen, the owner. And we have some potted flowers that we'll need also to offer the ancestors. Hello, we're at the Chinatown Memorial, and uh, this will be the site of our rituals for today, but it's the same for if you're at a family grave or a uh, tomb site. So the first thing you do when you arrive is that you start to sweep the, the site, sometimes the tomb is sweeping site. Okay, so you up. Oh, sorry. Okay, and if there's any grass that's covering the, 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 the headstone or the monument, then you have to cut it off, but you should be good here. Then after you're done that, you have to start setting things up. All the chocolate to your right, and then all the, the bowls and the, the cups are to your left. So the pork and the chicken are representative, representative of the three rituals, the three offerings. Um, before there would be fish or duck, but we don't really use those anymore. And normal families just use chicken and pork now. So the dessert is just something sweet so that you could go home with. 
And also the fruit is for uh, health and longevity. Okay, this is all for um, like a normal family uh, ritual. So that's why there is included rice. If you're if it's for like gods or uh, deities, it's normally there normally would not be rice. But because these are normal people, we use rice. Now that you have everything all set up, it's time to light the incense and the candles. Um, the incense are to transmit your wishes up to the skies. And then the candle is to light the way. So that's why these two are the, very, the most important. Two candles is like the two porch lights. There's two porch lights, the two lanterns next to your door, just to signal that someone's home. The three incense is to represent heaven, earth, and people. And so it's an auspicious number. Every time you do offerings of incense, you either do one incense, three, or um, any other multiples of three. So three, six, or nine, and seven. So this is the white, the white stuff is called kaiti, the long stuff. And it's to basically bribe the guards on the road. So this is all, this is for normal guards. Uh, this stuff is also important. It's gold, it's silver, and there should be gold, gold ingots. So this is the money that they use. And this is kind of like an offering plate that they put on top. This is the offering plate they put on top. And then the rest of them are just charms that is to protect your ancestors. You bow three times and then you can light it on fire. While that is burning, I guess it's time to see Dao, which is to uh, offer the liquor. And to offer the liquor to your ancestors, you just need to pour it on the ground. So now that this is done, we could do our final um, theme jiao to offer up the wine. And then the whole ritual is done. So just make sure your candles are burning, burn all the way through. And you could just leave the incense to uh, continue burning until afterwards. Traditionally, after all the, all the ritual is done, the food is then split up and then the, the, jet, the living can, can, uh, can have some and take them home to eat. Great, thanks, uh, thanks to Jeffrey and uh, to Doris for uh, for taking us shopping in Chinatown. Uh, I, again, it's been tough for a lot of the businesses in uh, Vancouver Chinatown. I'm sure in Victoria Chinatown, many other places. So um, I'm glad that uh, they're able to kind of highlight some of the places for us to to do some shopping and uh, keep some of those small family businesses alive. So I, I'm going to actually just. Uh, uh, Hope you will indulge me in um, talking a little bit about you know you've heard the word tradition several times and um, you know what are traditions and how does Qingming fit into um, you know what it means to be Chinese Canadian Canadian and and even you know how is uh, Qingming celebrated or uh, practiced in different parts of the world so I've got a picture up here and you notice at the end when uh, Jeffrey was showing you the the money the gold and the silver. Well, this is how, uh, for a long time, including in my family, there was folding. Long before Qingming, you spent weeks folding that stuff up to resemble gold and silver ingots. And they'd be you know, packed in these kind of garbage bags full uh, and then burned at the uh, cemetery site. So I remember when my grandmother, who um, lived to be 100, so she made it to that kind of magical uh, age, uh, well, I remember when she was in her 90s, um, you know, we would fold the paper with her and things. And then I remember after one Qingming, uh, she just kept on folding, folding and started to fill her room with all these uh, folded gold ingots. And uh, finally, my uh, grandmother asked her one day, what are, you, what are you doing? And she said, well, I don't really trust that the grandkids know what they're doing. Obviously, she'd watched us and we'd been screwing up all the place. So she thought that she would fold a bunch for after she passed away, so we'd have money to burn for her. Um, otherwise, you know, she was going to be poor in the afterworld. So I, I kind of share this story because, in a certain way, you can see, you know, is there a wrong way to do this? Is is your great grandmother or your grandmother starving to death because you didn't actually do it properly? Well, one of the interesting things is, in some sense, the the practice of Qingming really does vary in lots of different places, and you could say that. That version that actually Jeffrey and Doris were passing on, were passed on obviously to our generations, me, my, 
by people who came from rural China, these villages in you know the four counties region, the, the Siap region, and what they brought here was a kind of rural version that was being done in 19th, 20th century rural China in the south, in these Guangdong province areas. Um, it's different. It changes over time and changes from place to place. And, uh, and one of the things I, I think for us to, you know, it'd be great to think about is that Jingming really is about, yes, it's about the ancestors, but it's also about you. It's about you, the living. And what matters in life matters in death. And so this shop is uh, a, one of many shops that used to exist on Queens Road in Hong Kong. Some of you may have been there before. And they, uh, they're a shop like the ones that uh, in Chinatown where you can get things for, for Qingming to take to the, the grave site. And if you look closely, they'll have things like Apple computers, okay? Um, and, uh, Doris and uh, Jeffrey didn't mention that because in the late 19th century, our, our direct ancestors didn't have Apple computers in the village. So they weren't uh, hoping for you to send them an Apple computer or, um, you know, me, when I'm dead, I want my kids to send me an iPhone. And so they, you can go to these shops at Hong Kong, you can get a house, you know, a nice suburban house with a nice balcony. Um, Chanel bags, because, you know, again, you want the good handbag. And that is an actual, you know, four meter long paper yacht. So this was in a shop in Hong Kong just before Qingming. So someone had ordered a pretty large yacht. Now, I don't know how they're going to burn it at the grave without burning the whole cemetery down, but there it was. Um, so again, what matters in life matters in death. So in Hong Kong, and these, these photos I actually took about eight years ago, Money mattered and wealth and Chanel bags and yachts. And so that's also how you practice Qingming. When you went to the grave site, you needed to send them good stuff. Um, so in a certain way, I think you know, I'm, I, it, it, Qingming makes me think about, you know, who will remember you and where will they remember you? So, so we've been talking about Qingming as what you're supposed to do in remembering your ancestors. But in, in many ways, um, Qingming is as much about my great grandmother wondering, you know, who is going to remember you or her? Um, what's the connection between, you know, the afterlife and the living? And Qingming is, in some sense, you could say, that way that we, you know, connect with our ancestors and that they connect with you. And when you're alive, you wonder once I'm gone. So my great grandmother, uh, um, you know, when she wasn't folding gold ingot, ingots for her, uh, for her future savings, um, she would watch maple leaf wrestling and she would practice English talking at all the maple leaf wrestlers, though those who are older uh, than, than uh, old enough, you'll, you'll remember maple leaf wrestling. And she was practicing English, you know, and she, I could, I, you'd hear her say, how, you know, how do you do? And you know, these phrases in English. And so again, my grandmother asked her, what are you doing? And she said, well, after she passed away, she, was, she had chosen to be buried here in you know, Vancouver to be with, again, her grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And, uh, and she knew that the people around her might not all understand Cantonese. So she was learning enough English to be polite to her neighbors. Um, and that's what she was doing, um, wrestler talk or something. I'm not sure why she was trying to learn English from Maple Leaf Wrestling, but uh, it all made sense to her. So... That idea of, of that connectivity between the living and the dead, and this is really because the gates of the underworld open at this moment. It's, uh, you know, the, the, that's why it matters that day when the gates open and you can burn things and send things to your ancestors. And they can, you know, they can also, in some sense, affect your life. And so you ask for things like win the lotto, if, you're, if you care about the lotto, but also help me pass the exam or make sure my, my daughter has a, you know, a, a good pregnancy and has a, a healthy child. So you're, you're asking for interventions, um, not because in some sense you, you know, they're, they've become gods and they can change, but that just as in life, you know, they were 
your ancestors, your parents helped you, your grandmother helped you, that this is in some way a, a way of continuing that relationship. Um, I remember when my grandfather passed away, um, you know, half a year later, my, my grandmother was very agitated once we were having dinner. And she said, I forgot to give him a belt. So it's Johnny Walker. What mattered in life to him is what matters in death. So I'll bring Johnny Walker. Right? Um, if you like chicken nuggets, I'd bring chicken nuggets. And in some sense, that's what makes Qingming powerful and meaningful is not whether there's something that Confucius said, this is the right way to do it and we still do it. Um, that tradition in some sense is the things in your family, the things between you and your mother or your grandfather or whoever that you're remembering. And so in that sense, I hope that's uh, another way that uh, you know, as you gather here tonight and think about what Qingming means, hope that's also a meaningful way of thinking about the past and the present and the future, and maybe when you're thinking of where you're going to be buried or whether you're going to be tossed, your ashes are tossed into the ocean, um, that's a way to think about the past, the present, and the future. So, Sarah, so I'm glad, thank you all for coming tonight, and uh, I really hope that, uh, uh, you know, and as a last thing, sorry, I'm going to, before I pass it off, many of those cemeteries, we recognize them, but they're not designated. So, uh, for those who know the difference, that means they're actually not protected. So many of these cemeteries um, still could be turned into roads or off ramps for uh, for a highway. So just to just for the you know that those of you know that that map shows a lot of important sites, but they actually are not protected uh, right now by law. And so I'll leave it at that. And maybe uh, it's another thing to think about as Chinese Canadian Museum. Uh, spreads across the province, you know, uh, over the coming years, you know, how important these sites are to, to what we're trying to do. Thank you, Henry, and thank you, John and Imogene, uh, for those very insightful presentations. I think um, it, it's evident in the chat box that everyone has found this very informative. Um, for those of you who would like to revisit the resources, we have sent out a link um, and I'll, I'll ask Winnie to share that again uh, as you're welcome to watch those videos or share them with your network. Um, for those of you who have to, to leave, we are um, totally okay with that as it's uh, late in the evening. But for those of you who would like to stay and continue the conversation, um, you're welcome to. And so I will just raise a few of the questions that I saw in the discussion. Um, first was from Lorraine, and um, any three of you are welcome to answer this. Um, but she mentions that from her understanding, Qingming is a span of a couple of weeks. If people didn't make it out last weekend to pay their respects, can they still go or is it too late? It's not too late. Uh, you can go anytime you want and uh, you, some people would go many times, but uh, if you're just following the barest observance, it should be at Qingming, but it, whether you're a week early or a week late, it doesn't really matter. And, and if you miss it completely, August, uh, the ninth, the seventh month is, is a good time to go because Qingming is specifically for your own ancestors. You're not supposed to worship somebody else's ancestors, but in August or the seventh month, the seventh lunar month, then that's okay. You, you can provide offerings to anybody, the ones that don't have descendants, uh, the ones that have been forgotten. And so if you miss it now, you can always catch it up later on. So I'm gonna pipe up here. Uh, I don't personally celebrate uh, Qingming, but my cousin does. And as uh, Henry said, it's a relationship with one's family to the ancestors. So for any special occasion, Christmas, Thanksgiving, birthdays, my relatives would go to the cemetery because it's like that continuing relationship. So I think that's a, the point that Henry was making is, is a significant one. So, so there's never a bad time to go to the cemetery because you're reaffirming your relationship with your rel deceased relatives. And, you know, I'll just echo M. Jean's point that in a, I, I, you know, there's actually a time when uh, 
you know, when I wasn't living in Vancouver and I came back from very far away in New Jersey, you know, the other end of the world, and I wasn't there in time formally or whatever. And I remember going, oh, I'm sorry, I couldn't get a flight. And then my grandmother was going, who cares? You know, just go. And, and I think what she meant was exactly what MG was saying is like, yeah, I don't know what the doors of the underworld thing, but uh, just go. They'll know you came, especially if you, you know, leave something nice and you pour some Johnny Walker or whatever. So, you know, if it was, if it was my grandfather, it's like, yeah, the Johnny Walker will still make it through the soil, I'm, I'm pretty sure. And is it Johnny Walker red or Johnny yeah, Walker okay. black? Oh, uh, yeah. He was, he was Johnny Walker red drinker. But let's just say uh, as, I, as I became a little bit more comfortable in my life, it, uh, the, the labels, colors could change that, uh, that I brought. And, and you don't actually need to go to the cemetery um, because, as I mentioned, you, the soul is divided into three parts. And so it, the, the soul will be at home as well. And if you don't have an altar at home, and some, some, these days some people don't, uh, then uh, write your ancestor's name on a piece of paper, prop up a photograph, uh, put out something that uh, is something very appropriate to them, whatever their favorite food was. And uh, I actually participated many years ago in one family's uh, home, uh, Qingming, when they leaned out the window and poured a very small amount of Johnny Walker outside the window. And so you can do it at home. It doesn't have to actually be at the cemetery. But Qingming is typically the time when you would do it at a cemetery. And, and, and just to kind of add on that, that, you know, back when men were very far away from these home villages and their families, um, you know, some died overseas and they couldn't get their bones back or their families didn't know what happened to them, didn't hear from them, or they may have died in the guano mines, you know, in South America and, and perhaps their bodies were never made. But there's a lot of songs and stories and ideas that, uh, that for instance, uh, one of the reasons that a lot of people in some of those villages don't eat ducks and they, they eat geese, in, you know, barbecued goose is, is this, but ducks um, bring spirits back from far away, you know, when they fly, they fly back. And so there are lots of different stories that are almost on village level about men who are really far away, who you, who get literally the family lose track of them. And so uh, how does a spirit make it home? You know, that there may be, there's wandering hungry ghosts and, uh, you know, lots of things that are unhappy that couldn't make it home, but also how can you make sure that if, if you have a dear relative, your, your brother, you know, never made it back to the village, how do you bring their spirit back? What, what kinds of rituals can you do um, to ensure? And, and I think that anxiety that my grandmother felt about the belt, if you think about this in, in really serious terms of people being on the other side of the world, um, you know, making money, trying to help support you and, and, and you know, something bad happens, an accident and they, they die. Um, again, if you think of all the human emotions and relationships that, that are represented in acts like Qingming and, you know, creating a grave site, even though the body is not there or creating an altar to someone in your home because you know that they've gone missing. So, so again, uh, there's, there's a lot of ways in which a relationship is the key. Great. The next question is for Imogene. Um, did you find many headstones with Chinese characters only? Well, I think it depends on which cemetery you go to. And, and sometimes, you know, I've, I, I'm going to give an example of, a, of a, the Nanaimo Municipal Cemetery. So there is a Chinese cemetery in Nanaimo, but within the Nanaimo Municipal, Municipal Cemetery, there are some that are Chinese. And I remember go, being in the cemetery with, I guess I was with a tour and, you know, they, they let you loose and you're sort of wandering up and down the rows of, of the gravestones. And I walk by one and then I step, I did that sort of backward look. It's like, wait a minute, there's something here because it was for Charles Allum, A-L-L-U-M. But I saw the limb characters, you know, like I don't read a lot of Chinese, but I know when I see my surname. So I immediately took a, took a closer look at it. And so there is that thing for Chinese, you don't, as a sort of honorific, you don't just say, hey, limb or hey, lum, you would go alum, right? So 
this is how it got incorporated into a name. So by looking at it, it would appear to be an Anglo name rather than a Chinese name. So if you just had Lim or Lum, it would be clear that it was Chinese and also with the, the characters. So depending on where you are, especially some of the older ones, uh, so like the old Hillcrest uh, Cemetery, much of the, uh, many of the gravestones are only in Chinese. And so depending, like I said, you can go to different places and you might only see Chinese or you will see English and Chinese. So it's, it's a mix. I believe that concludes the questions that were typed out. We can do a last round or a last call. If not, uh, is there anything else you would like to share, John, Imogene, Henry? I'd just like to mention uh, that uh, Ching Ming, I think I've seen a few comments in the chat that um, some people haven't done this for a while. Uh, it is something that perhaps uh, current generations uh, don't practice quite as much uh, if they are of Chinese ancestry. Um, but I, I think uh, certainly I know Charlene uh, sees this. She does a tour for the Old Cemeteries Society in Victoria every year. And uh, this year it will probably be a, a virtual tour because of the, the pandemic. It'll be the, the beginning of May during Asian Heritage Month. Um, but but each year um, when we were doing that tour in person, many people came and they said that they were coming because they wanted to reconnect with the old ways of doing things that their family hadn't done for a long time. And so each year I notice at the Chinese cemetery, which is a closed cemetery, there are more and more offerings made. And so um, I, I think that that's one thing I'd like to mention that it is something, uh, to Henry's point, it, it is something that is for the living. And if it is important, uh, then it's it's never too late to begin. Yeah. And I'll, I'll echo what John just said. Actually, that again, that you know, I, you know, my kids, uh, they don't do it the same as I did it. Uh, you know, they'll they'll uh, uh, count how or, or or bow three times, and we do that. But they, you know, it's like a picnic. You know, we've we've made it kind of fun. We're there. It's a beautiful view. We've managed to be up over in uh, Forest Lawn in Burnaby. So you know. It is, you know, so they're used to kind of eating good food together and being there with, with again, or they never had the chance to meet my grandmother or grandfather or great grandmother. So in some ways, we, they don't, they didn't have the same personal connection. So in some ways, they have to have it vicariously through me. So I will tell stories about, you know, my grandmother or my grandfather and we'll eat food and they'll remember probably that we almost always have the curry beef that we get in Chinatown at, you know, a certain place. And so, um, yeah, it's never too late. There's no wrong ways, as long as you're, the, you know, you're doing it in, in the way that you, you, you're supposed to be there to remember. And if you can't make it there, do it somewhere else, do it in your backyard. Um, and just make it specific to, yeah, we're doing Ching Ming, but you know, we're doing it in the backyard this year because we, we can't make it there. Or um, it's interesting, I, I'll, maybe I'll end with, um, there's, there's a thing I wrote about, you know, when I was younger, when I, about what it meant to go to my grandfather's uh, uh, grave site and what it meant to, to, to go and visit my grandmother first and then her feeding me. And so I'll, I'll you know, I'll share it, shared that with Sarah and we need to, to post. Um, and so, uh, you know, you can, you can take a look at that as, uh, as uh, uh, there are, there are online uh, video tutorials on how to properly fold those gold ingots. So if you're really serious and you you want to you know do better than i did you know and impre impress your your grandmother or something then you can get the online tutorial there's a lot of things uh, online right now about ching ming and you know how to do this how to do that uh, they'll vary so don't look for the only one right answer because lots of people have different memories of the proper way to do it um but as i said it, it depends on when you left china which part of china you your ancestors came from uh literally if you go to you know, see up the four counties, you go one to five villages over, they may do things differently. 
that, you know, literally what's the right food to bring? What's this? What's that? There, there's a lot of variations in how these things are practiced, you know, uh, almost on a kind of a clan to clan, village to village way. So, um, so yeah, uh, you know, try to create your own family traditions if you can to pass on, I think is the, is the best uh, advice that, that, you know, if, if you're thinking of doing this. So this dialogue spurred a few more questions, if you're willing to answer. Yeah. Um, the first being, are Chinese burial sites in BC, sometimes like those in China, in a womb shape? I'm going to comment about, I've never seen any in a womb shape, but I know that uh, if you look at the older cemeteries, you have vertical monuments and more recent cemeteries are all flat and it's about caretaking. So, so the, the dating of a cemetery might be indicative of the type of monumental structure. So like I said, because you have those lawnmowers going across, they want things flat to the surface. So, so you can tell when you, if you go to a cemetery and there's lots of uh, vertical monuments, you know it's a much older cemetery. Uh, and uh, like I said, I, I think people, so I'm, it's, I'm not saying I know this. So uh, I'm not aware of any uh, of these uh, womb-shaped uh, tombs. And I think it's possibly to do with the, the landscape. Yeah, I haven't seen any of the the womb, or the, the the semicircular ones, which is is part of the feng shui concept. I haven't seen any in BC, but I have seen some in larger cities in in the states, uh, fairly fairly recent ones. Yeah, I, I, again, it varies. Uh, you know, John's absolutely right that uh, in places that were much more organized about buying a large plot of land collectively, you know, then they could, you know, do many things. Uh, I think for much of BC, the, where the Chinese cemeteries are, are often next to the main cemetery, but the physical segregation, it went into death, so to speak, that, you know, um, often the Chinese cemetery is separate from the cemetery for other migrants to the area who came from other places. Um, they're you know, where land could be purchased. Uh, even Chinese tended to also have different ideas about what's an ideal place for a cemetery. So views, mountain sides, uh, things like that, views of water, the feng shui, in other words, led them to actually think of where a good cemetery site would be, would be different than perhaps where the church, the Christian church, and therefore graveyard and cemetery were. So, uh, so there's, there are a number of reasons why the site of a cemetery uh, it may not have accorded with uh, with what um, the town thought was the right place for for a cemetery too and so it's one of the reasons why also that you know we have a, a, a provincial cemetery act which recognizes this is a cemetery and there's um, and yet uh, we've had uh, i think some uh, disagreement you could say about historically what we should do with chinese cemeteries if they weren't formally recognized or legally recognized at the time as cemeteries and whether they should be recognized now in some way as heritage sites, historic sites. So, uh, so again, you know, uh, it is an issue that we, you know, it, it would be useful to think about uh, for many of us. Um, you think of Hong Kong and not having enough uh, territory. Uh, what's interesting, uh, Helen Lee is bringing up. Yeah, so there's, uh, you know, there's a lot of cemeteries in Hong Kong that are very dense, much denser than you should, you're supposed to if you were back in, uh, rural China, uh, but that's urban Hong Kong. And so, the, you know, that uh, it might be the right shape, but you've got way too many people piled up on top of each other. Or in Singapore, you know, whole large cemeteries, uh, 150,000 Cantonese in one cemetery, 160 something thousand in Hokkien descent. They disinterred them all, put cremated them and put them into land 1% of the original graveyard uh, cemeteries and then turn the rest into uh, residential and malls. And so again, you think of the pressure in a place like Singapore for land that leads you to be able to do that. And so cemeteries are really interesting in some ways to think about, you know, the, again, what matters in life matters in death. So, you know, if, if malls matter, then they, that may replace uh, cemeteries. 
So I see that there's a question about the uh, Chinese and Japanese cemeteries. So I'm going to just speak to my own experience here on the island. So um, in the Nanaimo Municipal Cemetery, there is a mixture of individuals. Uh, in the Shimanus Cemetery, there is actually the, the Japanese uh, burials were much more than the Chinese, but they are side by side, so they're not mixed in. And in Cumberland, there is a separate Japanese cemetery, which is, you know, they're side by side. So you have Chinese on one side in its own plot of land, and then the Japanese in its own plot, but they are side by side, and clearly away from the main municipal cemetery by, I think, four kilometers, something like that. So the one thing that I will say about the Cumberland Cemetery is it is on a slight rise. I would say it has good feng shui because you actually see the water. And uh, I'm thinking like the Hillcrest Cemetery, it's again, slightly on a hillside and you just sort of look out into this very somewhat pastoral setting. So, you know, what Hannah was saying about the sort of perspective that you get, the viewpoint, I think when you when people had a choice in purchase, it did matter. So a couple more questions. Um, for large families, is it necessary for each member to pour the alcohol three times? <laughs> you know, again, you know, and John, I think <laughs> might have mentioned it, right? Is that back in the day, whatever that day is, uh, you know, there's the, the oldest male son would be responsible for certain things. Um, and that was the right way. And other people didn't even touch anything. and. Uh, but again, that's uh, <laughs> that doesn't have to hold. It doesn't hold anymore for most places. Um, if you feel like everybody should pour a drink, then then go ahead. If you if one person who you, you know if one of you used to drink with the person, you know, and that's the that's the person who maybe should be the one to pour and have a drink with with them. Um, so it is kind of interesting. Uh, I'll, I'll tell you a story of uh, a fa a family friend who. Uh, Let's just say the the man liked to drink, and uh, his wife was never enamored of his love of drinking. So she pretty much refused, after he passed away, to be taking alcohol there. And so literally there had to be a kind of shadow Ching Ming, where one of the sons would go separately by himself and, uh, and share the alcohol with dad. Um, so, you know as in life, as in death sometimes, that uh, that little arrangements and uh, resentments carry through. And uh, again, that's life, um, so to speak. So so I would encourage you to, yeah, if if it's going to take way too long to pour everybody, for everybody to pour alcohol, then don't do it, cause especially if it annoys the kids, you know. So I think we'll conclude with... Um a more lighthearted question to John, is your book out yet? And this book is on the Victoria Chinatown. Chinese Victoria, it is done. In fact, when this program is over tonight, this Zoom program, I will be hard at work uh, editing the index. It's down to that level, um, but I'm hoping it will be out sometime later in this year, 2021. So stay tuned. And I owe you there, are some, there are some really good pictures of the Chinese cemetery. <laughs> I would want John a forward so as soon as that's done too. So I'm probably the problem right now. <laughs> Thank you, Henry. I don't get that. We look forward to your book, John. Um, Richard has squeaked in one more question, which is for Imogene. So in the map that you presented of Northern BC, what is the name of the location at the very top? Um, was there a copper mine my grandfather worked there? Oh. oh, you're on mute, Imogene. On the, uh, it, are, are we making reference to the Heritage BC map? Uh, because the Northwest, that is for the Nass River, the canneries there. 
So, so that particular site, I'm pretty sure was for the, the canneries. And I have no idea what the situation would have been like for burials in that location. And there were, were three cannery sites uh, acknowledged in that Northwest area. But one of the things that, that Henry was saying, it's like, it's if community members acknowledge that there had been a Chinese presence. So we know that Chinese were, as I said, here, here, and here, they're all over. But if nobody is still there and th there's that last elderly family that might have remembered that Chinese family or that Chinese gentleman, usually it's men, right? Uh, once that person's gone, that history is gone. So, so if we happen to have cemeteries, that's why the forever after, right? So if you have that gravestone, that is your reminder that the community existed. Somebody buried them. Somebody cared about this person to have a formal burial. Uh, so, so there is a lot of lost history out there. And I will comment that uh, I have a student right now and she was born and raised in Powell River and she wasn't aware of the Chinese community there. So I've got her digging in the archives and she's like, whoa, there's, you know, like so many people that worked in, in the pulp, pulp mill, right? So there was this large population. They had numerous residences. Uh, back in 1916, there was the China Block. So it was actually a building owned by a Chinese family and it had a restaurant attached to it. So, you know, if she hadn't taken this course from me and it was, and it was on food, she wouldn't have started, you know, talking about the Chinese Canadian community to some of her, you know, the people in her neighborhood and it's like oh yeah there were chinese here it's like oh really didn't know so so this is that reminder that for many of the places just like shamanus like you have those murals but people were like well where where was the chinatown because i've seen a fire insurance map i know where the where the chinatown was it's it's where it's it's all industrial now so there's nothing there to see right and it's the same with, with Duncan's Chinatown. It had a vibrant Chinatown, but it, it got through, uh, it got plowed under because of the expansion or um, revitalization of a roadway, right? So, so a lot of uh, revitalizations allowed for the destruction of Chinatowns because at that time, Chinatowns were viewed as blights on the landscape. And it's also a way to push out the Chinese community. And, and, I'll, and maybe my, just as a final word for my final word uh, uh, for tonight is, is to echo what Emma Jean said about, it's one of the reasons why it was so important that the Chinese Canadian Museum was not just Vancouver and Victoria. That even though we associate that history as Emma Jean mentioned with these two large Chinatowns and with long histories, that in fact, you know, you could say Qingming and cemeteries is a metaphor for for history as a kind of forward looking exercise that even if some of these places don't have Chinese Canadians anymore and they're not there aren't people. Um, it's about moving forward, how we honor that history and those people, um, how we have a relationship, us the living with the dead. And that you can say that that can start up any time we've been saying, you know, even if you haven't done it, just so. Uh, Hillcrest, I, you know, it wasn't someone who was Chinese who, who, who took care of it and, you know, and in fact cleared off and did what you, what we're talking about, the tomb sweeping and the cleaning. It was, it was one of the people who used to work for Hillcrest Lumber who, who, who it was who, Ubo. Yeah, to Ubo, who took it on yeah. himself to do Neil this. Neil Yeah, and so, and I think that's happened in a lot of small towns in BC. In fact, quite a few of the nominations in 2015 that came into that process came from non-Chinese who said, look, I know that this is a cemetery and I think it's really, you know, I think it's important that we remember it for this town's sake and for our community's sake um, because of the racism, perhaps because of also that moving forward, that this was something that they, they wanted to do as, as to rebuild a community, you know, moving forward, even if it's about the memory of those who were there before. So, 
so I think uh, you know to, to tie it with the, the Chinese King Museum, you know, and um, and you know whose whose event uh, uh, this is, uh, you could say that that you know everything we've said tonight about Qingming and about community and the, li the relationship of the living with the dead, uh, you could say that that is uh, a value that we, we we put at the center of what this museum is. It's not a place, it's not a single place, it's not a single site. It's it's a process by which we think about who we are now and moving forward and how that is connected to our past together. So, uh, you know, what better way than to talk about Qingming and, and, and sort of the, our relationship with the past.